4 p.m. straight up. All right. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. Uh, welcome. We're at the beginning of our talk uh, with Dr. Joseph Aguilar on indigenizing archaeology and museums. Before we actually get started and introduce Dr. Aguilar, we always start our webinars with our land acknowledgement. Our Crow Canyon campus here in Southwest Colorado, we acknowledge the Ute, the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache on whose traditional homelands this institution sits and upon which we work and reside. It's very important to us at Crow Canyon to recognize and acknowledge that all of the work that we do here would not be possible without indigenous people in the past, present, and future. And we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all of humankind. We are extremely grateful for all of our indigenous people and partners, and we support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. This is tied inextricably to our mission in the world here at Crow Canyon, which is to empower present and future generations by making our human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. And you can always find out some more about us on our website at crowcanyon.org. Uh, I'm Liz Perry. I'm Crow Canyon's president. I know everybody has been, uh, or possibly not everybody, but most people have joined us on our Zoom webinars before. Uh, so just a couple of pointers. Um, if you want to move uh, my head or uh, Dr. Aguilar's head over to see the slides better, you can just grab the black line that will be separating the heads from the PowerPoint and move it over to the right. There is a live transcription available for you to click on uh, if you would uh, like that. Um, please just go ahead and put questions in as they occur to you during the talk. Please do use the, the Q&A as opposed to the chat function to enter your questions so they don't get lost in other discussions that might be um, occurring on the chat. We will try really hard to get to all of your questions, um, but you can always email them uh, to us afterwards and we can, we can share them uh, with Dr. Aguilar or see what we can do to respond. If you're having troubles with the Zoom, we are also live streaming on Facebook, on our Facebook page. And if you have to cut out early or you're missing this, you can jump onto our YouTube channel and see this talk at another time. We're coming to the end of our year of webinars. Our, our last one for 20, uh, 2021 uh, is uh, next Thursday, uh, December, or after Thanksgiving, December 2nd. Um, the Pueblo and Archaeological and Historical Society is a partner of ours, and we are co-presenting uh, this webinar with Dr. Todd Servell, a friend of mine from graduate school and brilliant archaeologist on the ethno-archaeology of Mongolia's Duco reindeer herders. So very excited about that. And we have, you might, might have seen uh, Dr. Thurival's talks uh, before on our webinars. I also wanted to mention, uh, don't, don't think we have lost, you have lost us forever. We'll start up our webinars again for 2022 on Thursday, January 20th. And we'll be putting out some information on our Facebook page. Uh, social media uh, about that. But our first speaker of the year is, is going to be um, Dr. Joseph Sweena from uh, Coach de Pueblo, who is also a mentor of all of ours at Crook Indian, a member of our board of trustees, who will be talking um, uh, about uh, uh, the Pueblo path in uh, ancient and modern times. So please uh, be looking forward to that in the new year. We often get questions uh, always, but especially this month uh, during Native American Heritage Month, if there's any um, way that, that viewers can make contributions to some of our Native partners and you can take a picture or a snapshot of some of these, um, uh, some of these organizations that are uh, collecting funds uh, to assist with COVID relief in, uh, among our uh, Pueblo and Diné partners. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Aguilar. Thank you so much for being with us. Dr. Aguilar got his PhD in anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. He is a tribal member with San Ildefonso Pueblo in New Mexico. He's also their deputy tribal historic preservation officer and an archeologist for Bering Straits uh, Native Corporation and a regional Alaska Native Corporation that's also working um, in New Mexico right now. So thank you so much for joining us and I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you. Okay, cool. Thanks uh, Liz uh, for that introduction. I'm uh, looking forward to the chatting, well, I guess virtually with everybody today and uh, look forward to questions at the end. Um, so I hope you uh, find some usefulness to my talk, maybe some inspiration 
and maybe a, a different way of thinking about archaeology, museums, and um, uh, the collections that uh, that are um, a part of those those disciplines. So I'm going to start sharing my screen, um, with folks. I got a few slides to show. Um, and we'll get started. So this is just uh, an opening slide here. Um, is that coming across okay, Liz? Yep, we can see your screen clear. Okay, great. Uh, so this the talk that I'm giving this afternoon, early evening, um, is going to focus on the intersections of indigenous knowledge um, and the discipline of archaeology and uh, museums or other institutions that, that house archaeological collections. Um, so this talk stems from my recent engagement uh, with, a variety, with a number of different uh, Pueblo material um, collections and cultural patrimonies that exist in local. When I, when I mean local, I mean like local to the Southwest um, that exist in local uh, national and international institutions. So I'll talk about my varied experiences um, with those collections and uh, relationships built with uh, the institutions that house them. Um, and ultimately, I'd like to um, uh, illustrate how uh, an assertion of indigenous intellect and interest uh, into those collections and institutions has led to meaningful uh, dialogue, uh, change, um, not only within those institutions, but within uh, Native communities who are um, uh, key stakeholders uh, with, with, uh, with of those collections. Um, so at the, at the foundation of, of what we see uh, in museums and other collecting institutions, uh, in my view, is the discipline of anthropology. Um, many of the collections that we, we see in museums, um, big and small, uh, would not exist without um, anthropology, with the, especially during the, earliest, um, during the earliest times of anthropology. You know, there's been numerous practitioners over the past century, really, that have created, built, and maintained uh, those collections. Um, and, the con and the collection continues to grow to this day, right? There's, there's um, uh, material culture is constantly being added um, to museum collections. Um, so what I, want to, what I want to talk about today is how we can move towards um, partnerships with museums, uh, partnerships that can be built between Native communities and institutions. Um, and I think when you have real partnerships that move beyond kind of bureaucratic modes of uh, quote unquote collaboration, um, when you move beyond that, uh, you have a, museums gain a much better and nuanced understanding of their collections. Um, and this leads to the creation of uh, more conscious exhibits and spaces that acknowledge and integrate indigenous intellect in ways that transcend traditional uh, standard museum practices. Um, so as with many indigenous cultures across America, North America, uh, public communities have uh, been speculated upon early on by anthropologists um, and the like. As a result, public intellect and material culture were heavily collected and extracted, especially around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, a, resi a residual effect of these practices are the just huge amounts of um, Pueblo material culture, uh, including intellectual um, property and culture. Um, that's one thing that's not um, uh, it's not a big focus on the intellectual property housed within museums in the forms of field notes, um, other archival material. Um, 
and the stuff is dispersed in museums and private collections uh, across the world, really, um, to this day. Um, so museums and other institutions um, as repositories of these materials uh, represent and perpetuate the early legacy of anthropology. Uh, fortunately, these materials have garnered a great interest amongst public people today, like myself, um, uh, especially artists who seek to engage and be inspired by museum collections. Um, public historical, historical consciousness is as vibrant as ever, and the partnerships that museums are creating with Native communities taps into a wealth of knowledge and understanding about collections that is as robust as it is uh, diverse. Historically, the tangible and intangible responsibilities and stewardship of museum collections have primarily been the, the responsibility of institutions. It's been out of the hands of Native communities. Um, so the, the thoughtful integration of indigenous scholarship and intellect as seen in the examples that I'll provide today um, serve as an intervention in assisting the expansion and improvement of the understanding of stewardship and collections and the overall relationships between native communities um, and, collection, and collections holdings um, in institutions more generally. As institutions begin to open their collections and ideologies to include Native peoples, a more informed and responsible study and representation of Native American art and material culture can emerge. Um, museums, anthropologists, and art collectors have learned and benefited tremendously from the collection of Native American material culture over time. If Native people are to benefit from these collections, perhaps not in the exact same manner, but to the same degree, uh, Native communities must begin to lead the way towards change uh, concerning the accession, uh, dissemination, and representation of our, cultural, our uh, cultural patrimony. Uh, public communities, as with uh, many Native communities historically, have not been included in the overall management uh, regarding uh, cultural patrimony held outside of our communities. Um, and given that the dissemination of public cultural patrimony has occurred in institutions and private collections across the US and the world, um, we realize that there's a logistical problem um, that might inhibit our active involvement in the care of our cultural patrimony worldwide. Um, but by creating models with culturally appropriate methodologies for engaging with the enormous amounts of our cultural patrimony across the world, uh, public people can assert ourselves and our way of thinking, our intellect in the processes of museums and other institutions. Um, because many of the routine practices of museums, the day-to-day -day practices, uh, tend to be void of Indigenous community input, Indigenous partnerships are needed to address the specific interests of Native communities uh, that redress the colonial legacies of museums and by direct relation, anthropology and archeology. span So some of the projects I'm gonna to highlight today are important demonstrations of um, how to engage, re-engage uh, public communities um, with our cultural patrimony. Um, these projects in my view are critical exercises in moving towards the goal of sustainably merging indigenous intellect with museum collections. Um, with the exercise of these individual projects, determining the directions um, of museum and collection engagement. While the collections and community voice represented in these projects have their geographic roots in the North American Southwest, um, at least the collections, um, the museums uh, occur across the United States, the potential exists for these projects to influence uh, the development of uh, indigenized methodologies um, and practice, uh, practices by museums, um, museum anthropologists, and art collectors. So the material culture um, presented in the following examples, um, the, the public material culture presented um, in, in my uh, examples, they, they represent beautiful, really nice examples of public material culture. Um, 
but they're they should be much more than just material culture themselves um we can uh learn about the the highly contextual and culturally specific nature of these collections by engaging with native communities um, this in turn can help inform the stewardship and care of those collections through culturally appropriate methodologies and practices so how then can pueblo uh, people assert their intellect into the collection um, we must take a proactive role in the dissemination of our cultural patrimony and intellectual pr property by transcending like i said earlier these bureaucratic modes of interaction um, namely consultation um, and create physical spaces and intellectual spaces that allow for heightened levels of interaction um, intellectual sp spaces created in this fashion um, can exhibit an appreciation of the power relations the power relations that govern the flow of ideas and challenge the underlying colonial frameworks that continue to deeply influence cultural institutions today. Um, the projects I'm going to highlight today aim to work within a framework that acknowledges the value of indigenous uh, intellect and the importance of its incorporation into the discourse of Pueblo material culture. In this way, projects such as the um, such as these are growing the intellectual potential and value of museum collections by applying indigenous knowledges. Uh, each of the institutions highlighted here are uniquely situated within a disciplinary legacy that is inextricably tied to public communities. Um, having this situational awareness um, by institutions allows for a careful consideration of how to redress past institutional practices and open up new intellectual spheres. So that's kind of the, the backdrop for um, my thinking um, about how I engage with, um, with museum collections and by, by, by extension, how public communities, I as a represent, representative of my own public community and public communities in general, um how we how we re-engage with museum collections um so what i'd like to do here is just dive into some of the projects um i've been working on lately um I, I'm, I'm involved simultaneously with uh four five uh museum projects this is in addition to you know the the regular regular work i do uh, as an archaeologist and a tribal historic um, deputy tribal historic preservation officer, um, but it's it's um, it's really rewarding to to engage with collections and museums uh, to create um, representations or exhibits, catalogs, um, educational materials uh, that speak to. Pueblo experiences um, as seen through Pueblo material culture. So I work with um, uh, on a project with uh, that involves um, the, the redesign of the Chapin uh, Mesa um, Archaeological Museum at Mesa Verde uh, National Park up in Colorado. I also work with uh, the De Young Art Museum in San Francisco on an exhibition of um, Pueblo pottery and other North American Indian art. I'm also involved in the project with the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe, who's partnered with uh, the Vilcek Foundation uh, in New York City uh, to present um, a Pueblo pottery exhibition. Um, hopefully that's going to be opening up um, next year. I'm also doing a little bit of work with um, uh, the Mark Museum in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, they have a small collection of uh, Pueblo material culture uh, from the Southwest, and they have plans to exhibit the, the work and kind of um, uh, studies of A.B. Warburg. Um, and that exhibition is planned to open in um, in um, March of 2022, 
Um, that project is, is early in, in the early work, so I won't spend too much time talking about that project today. And the most exciting project that I'm involved in, uh, in, in the museum world involves working with my own community here at San Alfonso Pueblo. Um, as we are in the very early stages of thinking about um, uh, how we create our own, um, and I, I hate to use the word museum, or cultural center, because what I what I'd like to see created here is something that that is inspired by a museum or a cultural center, but um, kind of breaks like literally breaks down the walls of of what um, or, or, or totally throws out what what public people um, should conceptualize uh, what a museum should or or should not be. So I'll talk about that last. Um, but first, let's talk about some of the work I'm doing with uh, Mesa Verde. So many of you know, are familiar with uh, Mesa Verde National Park and the Chapin Mesa, Chapin Mesa Archaeology Museum. Uh, it's been exi in existence almost as long as the, the, the park itself. Um, and they're in the, in the middle of redesigning that entire museum. Um, so the, the park has partnered with um, um, uh, University of Colorado a Museum of Natural History um, to, to begin the, um, the redesign. And one of the first steps um, in content development for the renovated exhibits um, at the museum, at the Chapin Mesa Archaeolog Archaeological Museum, was to schedule a couple of events in Cortez, uh, Colorado, and Albuquerque, and at Boulder, um, and in Durango at Fort Lewis to just explore and brainstorm some of the ideas and topics um, from within the discipline of Southwest archaeology and museums uh, that are relevant to the project. Um, part of this process involved inviting uh, uh, members from the 26 affiliated uh, tribes um, that are associated with Mesa Verde um, to these meetings. Um, many of these events were held on college campuses. Uh, one event was held at the Indian Public Cultural Center in Albuquerque, which made it possible for um, folks to attend. Um, and this was a pretty important project aspect to the project as a whole. Um, there was public events that were held uh, in some cases. Um, there was lectures that were given, uh, lots of workshops that have been held um, at some of these locations. And, and the goal of this outreach um, was to inform the larger community, including the native community um, and students uh, about the project and to engage uh, in discussions um, of issues related to Southwest archaeology and uh, representation of public culture in museums. Um, the workshops helped to engage Southwest archaeologists and public people uh, working in the Mesa Verde region in discussions about uh, relevant um, research topics or, or content related to archaeology um, that could provide uh, important content for the, um, the renovated exhibits. Um, so the, the, here's a, a photo of, um, oops, a photo of, um, one of the meetings held in Albuquerque at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. So we have representatives here from across, um, uh, representing, uh, some of the 26 affiliated tribes, um, of Mesa Verde, um, <laughs> And so the reimagining of the museum at Mesa Verde is a case which speaks to the culturally particular um, uh, nature of indigenous and collaborative archaeology. Um, this represents a, a kind of shift in the engagement of uh, uh, native peoples with museums. Um, and it seeks to integrate um, you know, archaeological archaeological materials and um, public material culture uh, with indigenous peoples. So we're in the kind of latter stages of um, of this project. Um, I think we're close to moving to exhibit design. 
but it took close to two or three years of uh, discussions. Of course, the, pan the pandemic uh, made it difficult to, to have really important discussions, which should be done in person. Um, so we did a lot of meetings over Zoom. Um, um, and we've made some really, we've had some really important discussions um, about archaeology, about museums, um, its relevance to the, to the museum itself. Um, and important discussions that were also very, very difficult. Um, but what's resulted um, and what I hope results um, is the creation of a new space um, that truly represents through the integration of um, indigenous intellect, um, Pueblo peoples of the Southwest. The next project, oh, and this is just a photo of one of the days where we met, I think this was in, um, I wanna say Boulder. Uh, we met and we had a huge brainstorming session of, um, of archeologists um, because I'm a native archeologist, uh, a, a person, a native person who's an archeologist, I sit on two teams. One team is an archeology, span uh, team of archeologists. The other is a team of indigenous people. It's not deliberately set up to, to be dichotomous in that way. It's just that there was, it's easier to have discussions um, within those two groups separately. Um, and this is just a representation of a, um, a series of discussions that we had over the course of an entire day. Um, this is one big, um, beautiful representation of a brainstorm. Um, so you see we have big, big kind of topics that we've broken down into smaller, important topics um, and it's just a, a cool representation of some of the, the talks that we've uh, we've had over the course of the um, this process. Um, next is um, uh, a photo of the de Young Museum. I'm involved in a project at the de Young Museum um, that involves what's called the Thomas Weissel Family Collection. Um, it was a collection that was endowed by Mr. Thomas Weissel uh, to the De Young Museum, the Young Art Museum. Um, and the collection is an anthology of Native American art assembled over three decades uh, by Mr. Weissel, um, who was a, a tech pioneer uh, in Silicon Valley um, early on. And, um, he does a lot of other things, um, but he's also a noted collector and advocate for Native American art. Um, the collection, the endowed collection includes approximately 200 objects and spans nearly a thousand years of artistic production um, from 11th century Pueblo ceramics to 19th century baskets and um, pottery um, by recognized artists such as the Hopi, uh, Hopi table artist Nampeo um, and Navajo weavings, it just kind of runs the, the gamut. Um, so for this project, um, the, the museum reached out to uh, a small cohort, if you will, of, um, of Native people who served as advice, who are serving as advisors um, for, the, for the project. Um, and what we hope to do for this project, um, because the bulk of the Pueblo cultural material is pottery, what we, what we hope to do uh, was investigate uh, Pueblo pottery beyond its aesthetic presence and begin to articulate the, um, the deeper uh, Pueblo meanings um, in which they were made and the worldviews that informs them um, as they as, as viewers uh, read through material shapes and design and designs. Uh, so we were invited by the, the Young Museum um, to help them get to a, a deeper, more nuanced understanding of the, orange, the origins of these um, ceramics um, and the ongoing uh, stories that they continue to tell. Um, so what we recognized early on um, was that any work on this pottery, any understanding of this uh, collection of pottery must begin with the Pueblo understanding and uh, conversations about ancestral pottery 
rather than debating uh, epistemologies and or property rights or focusing on aesthetics. Um, so here's a close up of uh, one of the pots that's represented. Um, uh, I think it's a different pot, but it's still beautiful. Um, so the de Young reached out early, um, early on uh, in the onset of uh, the project um, to form a partnership. Uh, again, partnership is a kind of a deeper relationship than just a collaborative one uh, that would allow for uh, appropriate discussions to take place regarding the exhibition. Um, the people who comprise this um, advisory group uh, were from different public communities, um, from different generations, and we all had different responsibilities within um, our communities. So for example, you know, myself, I was an archeologist and a tribal historic preservation officer. So I brought that understanding uh, to this group. Um, what really characterized um, our group and our relationship with the De Young Museum was um, the openness, uh, the integrity, the honesty, and the generosity um, that permeated our conversations. Um, and this made, making difficult decisions or more informed decisions about um, the representation of Pueblo pottery um, made, made making those decisions uh, much easier to do. Um, most significantly, there were different levels of cultural sensitivity that were discussed for different pots, for example. Um, and a lot of these conversations really cut to the core and corrected non pueblo people people's generalities and misconceptions about um, about pueblo pottery and the context from which they come. Um, and we could only get to this kind of understanding um, from engaging with uh, appropriate pueblo partners. Um, so the results of this dialogue will be captured. Um, in the exhibit itself and an accompanying catalog. Um, and this is all a, a kind of a different approach. It's a, it's a culturally appropriate approach um, to, to representing um, ancestral Pueblo pottery. Um, in the end, you know, we had to make uh, kind of informed decisions and careful, carefully made decisions about which um, aspects even of material of public material culture uh, we'd want to portray. Um, so in the end, it, it made us realize that there is no conclusive way to reconcile Pueblo and non-Pueblo ontologies. Um, and, and the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco um, really respected those boundaries. Um, and because of that, we were able to build a uh, trusting relationship uh, and create an environment um, that allowed for the free flow of ideas and um, different, um, different perspectives. Um, so hearing about the distinctive differences of worldviews, uh, Pueblo, non-Pueblo worldviews, um, it's truly a, it was a real pleasure um, um, to, to work on, on that project. Um, and it really presented a unique opportunity to, to learn from one another. I'm also involved in a project with the School for Advanced Research, um, Indian Arts Research Center, um, who has partnered with the Vilcek Foundation of uh, New York. Um, they've partnered together to develop an exhibit focused on Pueblo pottery, which is um, entitled grounded in clay uh, voices from Pueblo country. So this is designed to be a community-based traveling, exhi traveling exhibit um, developed to showcase the deep history and beauty of Pueblo pottery while bringing to life the complex narratives and stories um, of this essential art form. Uh, the Vilchuk Foundation uh, art collection includes several collecting areas 
Um, so they, they collect um, like, like lots of collections, um, uh, different areas, including American modernism, uh, pre-Columbian art, um, contemporary art by foreign born artists. And they also just happen to have this awesome collection of um, Pueblo pottery. Um, and so they, they partnered with SAR uh, in Santa Fe um, to create an exhibit um, in SAR having the, the deep connections that it does to the, the, the public communities of the Southwest. Um, we're able to use that network to involve, um, I'd say it was a close to 40 um, artists, uh, scholars, um, public people from various backgrounds. Most of them are, um, are uh, public artists um, to engage with these public communities um, and public people. Um, and get their perspectives on the importance of Pueblo pottery to, to communities and some of the more nuanced ways that, that potters and artists uh, go about, the, go about their, their ways of creating and firing, not just pottery, but different types of art. Um, so these community members, I think there were 60 to be exact, over 60 community members from different public communities uh, made contributions um, to the catalog uh, in the form of written essays, uh, poetry. It was basically fee form. And that was a, the, one of the really cool things about um, the contributions to, to this catalog and the exhibit where there was no um, predetermined kind of forms. Um, a lot of people did kind of traditional writing captions. Um, but from just from the, the few examples that I've seen, there's there's a there's poetry there's a other written expression so it's a really cool kind of uh, tapestry of um, of Pueblo thought and intellect as it relates to to Pueblo pottery. And here's an example from um, SAR's collection on the left. It's a piece of what's known as a Tewa polychrome. Um, and on the right is an Ogopogi polychrome um, from Tewa, Tewa world, likely from San Aldefonso Pueblo. I chose to write captions about, about these um, individual pieces. I chose the Tewa polychrome on the left uh, because it, it, um, it was used around the, the turn of the, the 16th, 17th century, late, late 1600s. Uh, so it, it was widely used um, around the time of the Pueblo Revolt, which is uh, an, an area that I, a uh, time period that I focused on for my, um, my dissertation work. Um, and I chose the other piece because it's another Tewa piece. I wanted to, to choose pieces that somehow, um, uh, these kind of had a little bit of representation of me in them. So I chose to, to write about Tewa pieces. Um, so I don't want to share too much about what I wrote. You'll see it in the catalog, but um, these these are some of the, the 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 types of ways that through this project, public people were um, were 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 giving kind of life to these to these pottery. Um, so lastly, I'll talk about um, the work that I do that I'm involved in. Uh, here at San Francisco Pueblo. Um, here in our community, we've, we're in the early stages of, um, I guess the research and design phase, if you will, of creating our own uh, museum and cultural center. Those are the words we use now to, to describe it. Um, good, and I, and I, I hesitate to use museum or cultural center because I think there are um, different ways to think about museums and museum type spaces, um, something that's not traditional, something that connects the inside of our community with the outside. So visitors connecting with our community inside. Um, I think there's a way to think of these spaces that connects the nature of people's view of the world that is not Western and traditional. Uh, there's a way to think of these spaces that pushes people away from um, a colonized museum 
or a museum that controls the space, the artifacts, the art, the story, and the people into a box created by outsiders and architects. So that's what's, another thing that's really cool about, about this project is that we're starting, instead of starting from a, uh, we're not starting from a blank page, we're starting from a blank landscape, literally. I mean, we, we were out on the landscape looking at potential um, uh, site locations and that was our template was the landscape and that's what we started from a landscape perspective rather than a uh, museum or exhibit or gallery uh, perspective which is a really cool way of, of conceptualizing these things um, whereas in the other projects I'm involved in there's a set space there's uh, walls there's a building there's an institution here we're creating something uh, what I like to say is like from our hearts. Um, so it, what, what became apparent um, in our early discussions um, uh, about, this, about this place um, was that we had really deep discussions about identity and representation, um, how we identify ourselves um, as Pueblo people, as San Alfonso people specifically, uh, to the outside world. Um, we really went deep into what are some of the things that make us uniquely San Alfonso people. This is what we wanted this place to be about. This is what we want this place to be about. Um, so we've moved into conversations um, about how to best use these ideas for something um, like I said, a community museum, a cultural center, something else uh, unknown. Uh, my advisor back at Penn, Richard Leventhal, talked about the idea of a non-museum, something that was a museum but wasn't. Um, so we're, we're kind of thinking along those lines. Um, someplace that the public can uh, develop that focuses internally on um, who we are as a people um, and how we want that represented to the outside world. So this is, I think, as cool as the other projects are that I'm working on that, that involve museums, um, I think this is one of the, the more enriching, one of the most enriching kind of experiences that I've had as, a, uh, as an archeologist or as a person who works with museums. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, to see how this materializes uh, in the coming years. Like I said, it's in the early infant stages and we're just taking kind of really big concepts and ideas and trying to figure out how does that materialize into this place or this thing. Um, so I think I've come to the end of my presentation here and I'd be happy to take some questions. I'm not too sure if there's any that have uh, already come through the chat, um, but if there is, I'd be happy to take them now. Appreciate you, appreciate your time. Uh, and yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph. That was spectacular. It brings up lots and lots of questions uh, on the chat and uh, and for me and, and I know for, for some of our staff at Kirk Canyon. Cool. Maybe kind of leading off of that last uh, topic and, and that, that incredibly special project in your own community. Um, I, I was wondering if you maybe maybe talk a little bit more about um, how the concept of, of museums uh, can and should uh, evolve um, uh, in an in indigenizing or sort of post-colonialist um, perspective. I know that you know what one of the common um, and justifiable critiques of, of of museums from a Western colonial perspective is that they they represent um, uh, indigenous culture as as uh, static as one moment uh, in in history one moment in the past that is is divorced from from the reality of the continuous link between ancestral uh, and descendant culture and and the needs of indigenous communities uh, and people today and in the future is there has there been some thinking about on that on that project or um, in in your mind about uh, how museum the concept of a museum or a non museum could could extend to be useful uh, to um, 
uh, indigenous people and, and indigenous representation uh, in, in the contemporary world? Yeah, we've, we're definitely trying to break down the, the idea of, of what a museum is or, or should be in, in these discussions. Um, and for better or worse, you know, the, the only museums that, that we as a community are familiar with are, are these museums that, that, that uh, go by that, that colonial model that you're talking about. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, there's lots of uh, institutions locally and across the US who are challenging that. And um, there's some really good examples of that here locally. Um, but when you get to the foundation of it, these, these museums, even the good ones, they have this colonial kind of uh, foundation to them. Um, and it's hard to, hard to escape that. It, it takes generations, it takes um, different ways of thinking. Um, so I challenge myself and other community members to just throw out any kind of ideas of, of what a museum is or should be and um, start from a, a, a blank page really and create something that um, truly represents culture, public culture, Sinai culture. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. And it's a difficult task. Um, it's a fun task, but it's a, and we're not going to get it right, likely. I mean, completely right. We're going to get a lot of things right. Um, but I think we're, we're thinking in a completely different way about how to represent ourselves to the outside world and how to represent ourselves to our own selves, which is kind of a weird saying, but like, what does this mean to us? Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely lots of ways to to challenge those old models. That's fantastic. It sounds like uh, your work um, with with uh, De Young was was really interesting and, and engaging. Um, some of the ways that that you talked about that uh, really struck me in terms of um, uh, any understanding of that collection had to begin with a with a Pueblo understanding as opposed to a, a Western aesthetic understanding of, of aesthetics. Um, uh, I'm just curious as to uh, were, the, were there points of particular tension and, and push and pull uh, in, in those, in those um, kind of collaborations and, and discussions about, about presentation um, that, uh, that, were, that were notable to you, areas of, of maybe um, you know, disagreement uh, that were difficult to resolve? Yes, there definitely were uh, within those conversations, and and like I said, like I like I, the way I described this project was we built a relationship based on trust, trust and understanding, and I felt really privileged to be a part of those conversations, uh, the good parts of it, the bad parts of it, all of it. Um, and so to be respectful of those conversations, I, I can talk generally about some of the, the kind of um, challenges and successes that we've had, um, but to be respectful of that relationship that was built between us, um, I, I won't go too deep into kind of the, the kind of nuances or particular challenges or successes that we've had. Um, but yeah, I mean, without going to, it's, it's kind of find a way to articulate some of those challenges without divulging too much. Um, there was definitely opposing worldviews uh, for sure. Um, even within the, the native advisory group. Um, and I was, I was one of the, I don't wanna say I was a younger, but I was one of the younger, um, members of that advisory group. And I, I had a kind of a different way of thinking about things. Um, and some of the other participants um, also had ways that, that challenged my thinking. And we kind of brought all that together um, and just had these really good conversations with, with, the, with the museum, um, who I really give a lot of credit to because they they just they listen they spent a lot of time listening they spent so much time listening to us and um it felt really good to just be listened to uh and so yeah there was lots of challenges and and 
they'll become apparent when you see the catalog or the exhibition. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. It, was, it wasn't so much that I was, you know, digging for gossip, but the... Oh, but the, I get it. Yeah. We do a lot of... Um, uh, our, our folks at Crow Canyon and our Indigenous partners do a, a lot of work in trying to educate, um, uh, you know, non-Native non people in the museum world, in, um, uh, in other contexts, uh, uh, as to... Um, meaning, right, and representation and, and why it's important for um, descendant communities today and, and uh, the way that they represent. So I was just kind of looking for any, yeah, any, and, and any sort of gonna, guidance. There's going to be some some deeper discussions um, in written form that come out in the catalog um, about about the process, really. And it, it was a unique process. I've never been a part of this type of process within a, a museum setting. And so I look forward to, to how this is all presented in, in the catalog. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. That actually um, uh, dovetails nicely with a question, one of the questions from uh, one of the audience members that came up in the chat um, around the concept of, of art uh, being used uh, uh, to in relation to the, the question was, how do you feel about the use of the term art in relation to the range of creations from indigenous people, both ancient, such as rock art through uh, contemporary um, indigenous art? Well, I'll, I'll first, I'll start that off by saying I'm not an artist myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not a public artist. Um, and it, it's hard for me to put a value judgment on the creation of, uh, of, of something that's both useful and aesthetically pleasing. Um, but I, I think a lot of public material culture is inherently art. We just don't think about it in, in that Western sense of the, the term. So there could be a, 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 I don't know, a utility bowl or something, a corrugated bowl, um, which is utilitarian, but it's also inherently a, a beautiful thing. Um, and when it comes down to it, I, I guess it's it's just people's preferences and what they choose to call something. Um, I don't know. That's a you, you get to that art versus utility discussion, and um, I don't know. I, I tend to see lots of things, not just pottery or other aspects of material culture, but like architecture um, or landscapes, even as like inherently beautiful and if that's called art then it's called art thank you that kind of um you were mentioning that things will come out uh, in in the catalogs and and some writing as a result of some of these collaborations and uh one of one of our listeners uh, was wondering if you could um describe a little bit more specifically like what's the end result uh, of the process they're not really sure how to visualize uh, what happens um, as a result of this collaboration um, well generally speaking like the the processes that these um, museums are engaged in with with public people um, are discussions about exactly this the end result like it's it's years it's like months hours of discussions that lead to making decisions about what material culture is going to be displayed um, the specific layout of an exhibit um, how many particular objects do we use which objects do we use which uh, objects do we not use um, and then some of this gets handed off to museum, professional museum designers who know how to conceptualize and design specific walls or cases or uh, things of that nature. Um, what, in for Mesa Verde, for example, we hand over a, um, uh, a guidebook, if you will, to the uh, exhibit developers who actually design the, the exhibits themselves, the physical exhibits. Um, and we work closely with them to, to make sure that our thoughts and ideas and perceptions about the material culture are, um, are represented in their designs. Fantastic. I, um, I loved the, the, the pots that you chose to talk about it. Um, 
on the SAR project about the, the context of, of yeah, one of really cool. the Tewa Polychrome being built around or created around the time of the Pueblo Revolt. And uh, I won't, I won't uh, ask for a sneak peek on that, but I definitely will be interested uh, to, to hear some of, the, some of that um, context when, when that comes out. And we had a question from the audience also uh, kind of along those lines around uh, what a great um, concept that is and asked if you, you knew of any um, sort of grant sources or programs that, that do this actively to fund visits by indigenous specialists in their cultures, material culture, basketry, pottery that's in museums um, in other places. Uh, uh, where where those museums are interested in having collaborations uh, from uh, other indigenous artists or, or, or cultural specialists, and which made me think of the the project you mentioned in in Germany, um, and I was kind of wondering if if that if that was kind of a, a, a situation as well where where that museum wanted to bring cultural specialists out to to look at those collections and and uh, be able to uh, you know talk to, talk to them about it. Yeah, well, as far as like funding to, to have um, Native people visit collections, there's lots of different sources out there. Some of them are, are targeted um, types of funding, um, such as funding to, to allow, um, say, like Native communities or officials from Native communities to visit collections, to, to, to view items that might be um, of interest to repatriate, for example. Yeah. There's that type of funding. There's um, there's there's funding to just have people go and visit uh, collections, and because a lot of what we see, right, is in museum exhibits, is just a small percentage of of what museums actually house. I mean, like the NMAI is like right. the perfect example, right, where you have a, a small exhibit on public material culture, and you have like a big warehouse full of it, and a miles, a couple miles away. Um, and so um, we're trying to, like for the, the Sanai project, we're trying to uh, find ways to, to engage our community members with those collections, just to open their eyes to the vast yeah. kind of amounts of, of material culture out there. Um, I remember when I first visited some of these places, I was just blown away and continue to be blown away even through all my years of experience. Incredible. Um, we have a question that kind of connects to the practice of archaeology today. Um, one of our uh, attendees mentioned that your examples uh, spoke to the way that museums are engaging with indigenous people with historic collections or previously collected collections. What are your thoughts on the ongoing accumulation of archaeological collections at museum based on new archaeological work, uh, academic and CRM? Um, have you seen museums or project proponents reassess how those collections are considered or evaluated through engagement with tribes or indigenous people? Yeah, that's a huge question. Um, I think I mentioned in my talk that the uh, the collection is the uh, and I put collection in quotes, meaning like the as we talk about collections in general, it it continues to expand. Um, you know, there's there's CRM projects, there's academic projects everywhere, and these all need repositories uh, someplace. Um, and so that's for for Pueblo people. For me in particular, um, it's it's somewhat problematic, or it is problematic because there's lots of material culture that exists already in these collections. A lot of it needs to be repatriated. Um, but yet we're adding to it. So I don't know if there's a, an appropriate fix, but one of the ways that we choose to handle um, that problem here in San Defonso with some of the work I do is we just kind of limit what we collect if we collect at all um, out in the field. Um, we leave things in place as much as possible. Um, you know, some projects are moving towards not even collecting at all, just maybe making field notes and observations and then placing things back as close to possible or where they came from. Uh, so I think those those kinds of practices, they're not standard, um, but I think if we move towards that, um, we'd be in a much better uh, position, I think, with, with uh, 
kind of museum collections in general. I will. I won't steal our um, uh, Susan Ryan, who uh, is uh, one of our head archaeologists here at Crow Canyon, is is uh, very interested in in working with indigenous communities and and uh, curation communities to talk about that that kind of thing, right? The future of of collection and should we be doing it anymore? Uh, so I'm I'm sure you'll be getting an invite to to a brainstorm around around that topic. <laughs> Um, let's see, well, we're, we're getting pretty close to the end, so I think I'll ask kind of a fun question, which uh, was, someone was curious about the image on your first slide and where, where that came from. I, I actually think I know, but I'm going to let you uh, <laughs> talk about yeah, it. That was that's would, a great If picture. you know, then you, you can say it. No, it's at, it's at the Museum of the American Indian, right, at SAR there? Or? It, well, that's, that is SAR at the Indian Arts <laughs> Research Center. Yeah. yeah that's their... Yeah, that's, one of their uh, their open storage uh, collection vaults. I, ha I haven't been been allowed in often, but I've been in a few times. It's, it's, it's a they beautiful. they do public it's tours, or they did at least pre pandemic. Um, that's that. I mean, SAR is one example where, uh, like a lot of museums, um, it some so I, I won't pick on SAR here specifically, but. Museums in general, they feel, a lot of museums, uh, they feel uh, inaccessible to, to native communities. Like lots of museums, like on the East Coast, I visit some museums and um, I know they have like tons of collections. When I was younger, you know, they had tons of collections and like I know X or Y Museum in Philadelphia or New York. Um, I know they have collections in the vaults, but like I couldn't see them. You know, and so yeah. I, I think that's museums, they have to work on that and on, on making their collections more accessible, whether that's in person or virtually or through special um, special visits. Uh, I think that's one way where the museum can begin to open up. That's great. Okay, I, I said that was last, but I'm going to throw in one last question that came in uh, from from Mike Adler, who says, sure. Woody, if you were to give advice to an indigenous community uh, constituting their own cultural center or museum, what would be your most important advice? Asking for a friend. <laughs> That's a question that I was asking myself and our community was asking herself. I mean, the, the best advice that I gave myself and my community was just throw out any idea that you have about what a museum should be and create it from your own experience, understanding, your own thinking, your own heart, and then just make it yours. Like a museum doesn't have to be a building with four walls and cases and a few representative examples of um, pottery or textiles. Um, it can be something more meaningful that that can acknowledge the um, the beauty and usefulness of of material culture, but also get to the the deeper meanings of what those things represent, which is people. Because museums ultimately are are about people, not things. And um, I think sometimes. I think museums for most of their existence have uh, have either not acknowledged that or have forgotten it, um, but I think it's getting better incrementally. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's just been a pleasure to have you and uh, we will we will be respectful of your time and let you move on to your next meeting, but we hope to see you again uh, on a webinar and definitely uh, at, at our campus, COVID permitting. Anytime, just let me know. Thanks right. everybody who, who joined this evening. Thanks so much. Take care, see you soon. <laughs>